Hallelujah. Genesis 50 and verse 20. I'm going to be reading from the NIV. Well, King James is up, but I like to read from the NIV. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people. In another translation, it says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. This is Joseph speaking, who had been sold into slavery by his brothers, had worked his way up through different promotions and got all the way to the head of state. He was the second man in charge of all Egypt, and Egypt was the superpower at that time. And at that moment, he is greeted by his brothers that come in because they need, they need wheat. They need food. And they come in, and they don't even recognize Joseph as the leader of the country because God has used him so powerfully. And they're before him, and he's hiding his identity to them because he doesn't want to show them. He kind of wants to see, are they different men than when they sold him into slavery, I believe. And so then he's finally telling them, I'm Joseph, the brother that you sold, that my father thought had died. I'm still alive, and God has blessed me in Egypt, and I've become great because my whole life has been pointed toward God this entire time. And so he begins weeping, and then he tells his brothers, hugs him and everything, and he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. He spared the people that sold out on him because he kept his life pointed toward God. That's so good. He didn't get bitter. He didn't just change jobs and start a lawsuit. He decided he was going to let God take care of the indifferences and the injustices in his life. And though he pointed at them and said, what you meant to do for harm, he changed that finger from blame to them, and he pointed it toward heaven. He said, God meant it for good. Whatever you're pointing at today, whatever you're blaming for things that have happened in your life, I want to challenge you before this is over to stop pointing at them and start pointing at him. Jesus, help us in this place today as we go into this word. And I'm asking you to instruct someone's heart to let go of wounds or pain or suffering or anything that someone has inflicted up on them and stop blaming but start proclaiming that God is greater in every need and God is greater than every circumstance and God is greater than every betrayal in Jesus precious name somebody said amen you may be seated in the house of the Lord I want to preach to you just for a few minutes, maybe 15, 20 minutes, on it's not rude to point. It's not rude to point. How many had your mother or your father tell you, don't point, it's rude? Raise a hands. How many have been told that? Almost unanimously, because as kids, we don't have that social structure where you have no, you know, barriers of if I point at them, they'll see me and know I'm talking about them. So kids, whenever you're holding them, they're like, yeah? And they just point right at people. And you're like, no, no, honey. They, you, we start early, don't we? we no, no, we're not going to point at people. That's not appropriate. It's, not, it's, it's rude to point. But I want to tell you that if we don't point to Jesus and our life doesn't point to God, it's, it's different when you're talking about the things of God because What's interesting in our lives is that as human beings, and there's plenty of social experiments that have happened about the crowd effect and how we get attention and what influencing does and how, it, and how we're driven to buy or purchase and other things. And so I'm not just talking about the crowd effect or whether you were trained up in a certain way to not do certain things. I think it's not rude to point to Jesus. 
I think it's not rude to point at him and say, look, I don't have a scientific uh, process for this possibly, but I've seen other people do the same thing, obey the same word, and get n- the same results. Amen? I've seen others that did not, did not have faith in God put their faith in God and start walking with God, and he starts making provision for them in ways that, no, that you can't even understand. You can't even wrap your mind around. I, I, I have so many stories of of missionaries who got into a desperate situation and began to get on their knees and pray to God, God, we need you to answer today. And in that day, a box comes in the mail with the exact same provision that they were praying for. And that box had to be prepared because they were in a foreign land. That box had to be prepared three months earlier to get there on the day that they prayed. And God did it just like that. He's a God of provision. I want you to know that. He's a God of power. And anytime we point to him, when we have needs. I, I'm just trying to encourage you. Every single need you have, point it toward Jesus. Every single want that you have, point it toward Jesus, and he'll give you the power and understanding to help you reflect and know that he's working in your life. So we reflect on the power of this truth, and I don't think it's rude to point to Jesus. I think, in fact, it might be rude not to. Imagine sitting next to somebody, you're being a cubicle away of somebody that's going through something very serious, and your life and your words never point to Jesus. Imagine if they lose their life or they go on to eternity, and they're standing before the white throne of judgment, and God tells them what well, all of their sins and all the things that they've gone through, and they find out that you were someone that was saved, walking with God, but you never opened your mouth and shared, like Matthew 28, 19 says, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. What if, what if there's somebody that needs to hear about Jesus, and you're the only Jesus they'll ever see, they'll ever know? You're the only Bible they may ever read at that point, what if we were to understand that it would be rude for us not to give Jesus to the world every day? In fact, it's a great honor and a great responsibility to align every part of our life to speak of Jesus, to align our blessings to speak of him, to align our finances to speak of him, to align everything that we have to point to Jesus. Amen? And so I pulled, of course, the story of Joseph. Joseph gets sold into slavery, and God's plan unfolds. He said, you intended it for harm, but God intended it for good. Only God can make some things good. I can tell you that. There are some things that happened to you that God did not choose, but others chose and made bad decisions and forced on you, and I understand that. And though God did not stamp it or ordain it because he gives man a will and men can do evil or good, and because evil things are done in the earth, God did not send it, but he can transcend it. He can help you step above it, and he can use it, and he can transform it for good. I don't know if you can understand how that happens, but I have been through a life where that takes place. I have been through a life where the the bad things can be transformed to good things. Which, of course, I think of a joke at this moment. Matthew, what am I going to do with this joke? Am I just going to put it down or am I going to say it? The pastor, my wife's like, spit it out. The pastor had to take a break for a minute and run out and take care of something that was happening in the parking lot. And all of a sudden, the devil showed up in the pulpit. And everybody started running for the doors and jumping out the windows. And they were screaming and hollering. And there was a man and a woman sitting right down front. And they didn't even flinch, didn't even budge. The whole church clears out because the devil shows up in the pulpit. And they don't move at all. And so then he finally, the devil asked the man, he said, aren't you afraid of me? Aren't you scared of me? Don't you want to get out of here? And he's like, no. He goes, you don't scare me at all. I've been living with your sister for 40 years. <laughs> I shouldn't have told that joke, Matthew. And then the lady sitting next to him, he goes, aren't you afraid? And she goes, I can't believe you didn't recognize your brother. Sometimes if we don't point our life toward Jesus, we can get bitter. We can get jaded. We can get to the point where we think we're living with Satan in our house. Amen? Amen. But the thing that changes everything is the significance of the role that we see God play in our surrender. 
I just want to talk to you for a minute about surrender to God. That is so important in our lives. And that's what Joseph did. He surrendered his whole life to God. His dreams play such a significant role that it's recorded in the holy word of God. But it did trigger jealousy. It did trigger anger in his brothers. It did cause, you know, them to hate Joseph. His father loved him, made him a coat of many colors. And so his dreams told a future story of of Joseph rising to prominence and rising in authority over them. And no one likes that. No one likes to hear that. Some say he should have kept his dreams to himself. I don't think that's the case. I think if you had a dream, you need to try to live it out. And I would tell you, if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. And if you have a budget to fulfill your dreams, your dream's not big enough. Joseph's dream was so big, it took the superpower of that day to fulfill it. He didn't have, if you were Joseph and you had this dream, your bank account would have never matched it. Your bank account will never match a God-sized dream. So Joseph has to surrender his life and point his whole life to God just to get the funding for the dreams that God has given him. So his first dream, Joseph dreamed that he and his brothers were binding sheaves. This is basically what an old sheaves binding would look like. They bind up wheat and sheaves or sheaves of wheat, and they bind them around, and then they would set them in the field and then come back and pick them all up as they were doing the work. And the grain of the field were in these sheaves, and they stood upright, and then the dream that he had was of these sheaves, but his Joseph's sheaves stood upright, and his brothers all bowed to his sheaves. In other words, they made obeisance to Joseph. And of course, that did not fit the hierarchy of their day, because Joseph was not the firstborn. So his dream symbolized a future leadership and dominance that made his brothers jealous. How many have ever had a dream that others around you do not support. Come on, a few of you. You know where you want to go. You know even possibly what you want to see in your life. And you are either the one that's not supposed to out, outdo the others. You're the one that's not supposed to come up. You're the one that's supposed to stay in your place, remember who you are, and remember where you came from. Am I talking to anybody right now? But you have something in you that keeps calling out to you. And you know that God has put something inside of you that beats that's bigger than where you are right now. And bigger than what you were raised in. And bigger than what you're called from. And so your past may never match what your dream says, but it was never meant to. Secondly, in his second dream, Joseph dreamed that the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to him. This dream further emphasizes Joseph's future position of authority and power. Some say that it represented his mother and his father and his 11 brothers, and others say it represented the time that it was going to take him to get to where God wanted him to be. But either way, family members concluded that this dreamer needed to die. Some people are not for your dreams, and there are other people who would like to kill your dreams. So be careful who you tell your dreams to, but don't give up on your dreams. Amen, somebody? It's clear imagery. It shows sheaves bowing down, cattle bowing down. It's, I mean, uh, other thing, sun and moon starts bowing down. And then later, there's other dreams that Joseph is able to interpret because he figures out what this dream means. And then the idea of bowing down is not um, the same as what you may think it is, but in their existence, their hierarchy and family was threatened by that dream. Have you ever had someone threatened by your desires to go higher? Oh, man. Sometimes you have to remove some people and put up boundaries in order for you to go where God wants your life pointed to. I perceive that there are people in positions of power and influence in this room right now 
Right now, there's something in somebody here in this room right now that others are not going to like, and they'll try to kill it in you. You have to bind up what you feel is most important in your life, and you have to be able to shed the other things because the people that are with you now that won't go into your dream with you are people that need to stay behind. There are some people that they call scaffolding. They'll help you put up the building, but they were, they're going to leave when you're done. They'll help you get maybe to a portion of of your dreams, but they're going to leave. And if they leave you, they weren't meant to stay. And if they leave you, let them go. Amen, somebody. If they can walk away, let them walk away. I don't mean to get vocal, but I want to tell you that if they love you and if they want the best for you, then they will believe in your dreams and help you get there. But his brothers took the other road. They decided they were going to sell him into slavery, and they took his coat, and they tore it, and they put goat's blood on it, and made it look like he was torn by a beast. And that coat of many colors was given to his father, and his father believed that his son, his precious son from his loving wife, Rachel, one who is his favorite wife. I don't know how that happens. I mean, we don't have that primitive of a culture anymore, but that happened in the Old Testament. They had multiple wives and concubines. But I want you to know that even if we lay all of that aside, he loved Rachel immensely, and this was the product of his love. She would only have one other child because of infertility issues. She would have one other child named Benjamin, and that child was loved immensely by Jacob as well. For you see, Jacob had worked seven years in Laban's house to get the right to have her hand in marriage. And when they did the ceremony, because of other customs of that day, they would not give Jacob Rachel because she was the younger daughter. They always had to marry off the older daughter first. And the Bible says that Jacob met Rachel at the well, and he fell in love. He fell for her. And the Bible calls her beautiful. And Rachel had a good personality, but she was gorgeous as well. The Bible calls her beautiful. And Leah, well, Leah had a better personality. (laughs) The Bible says she was cross-eyed even. The Bible records that she was not a beautiful woman. And so he gets Leah at the marriage night in the tent And cannot see anything, apparently. And he wakes up the next morning and he feels betrayed by Laban. And Laban says, no, no, we don't do that here. We marry the oldest first. Doesn't matter what you think of it. But if you want to work for me for seven more years, I'll give you Rachel. He worked 14 years just to take Rachel's hand. And that's how much he loved Rachel. But Leah's womb was blessed by God because he saw her troubles. And he saw that she was not loved as much as Jacob loved Rachel. And he opened her womb and she gave birth to so many of the 12 tribes of Israel. The people that would name the 12 tribes of Israel. And then, of course, Joseph came. Joseph's earliest life, he was born the 11th son of Jacob. He was way down here on the inheritance pole, like the hierarchy. He was way down here. He was going to get, you know, the family lawnmower. When everything was over, that's all he was getting. He wasn't going to get the house or the cars. He was going to get the John Deere rider. I mean, that's a good thing, but runs like a deer. I get one dad joke, okay? If you're a visitor, I apologize. He's favored by his father and given a coat of many colors. You know that he dreams greatness, and he wants to pursue it. How do you pursue greatness when your brothers throw you in a pit? You know what pit stands for, right? Prophet in training. Maybe Pentecostal in training. I don't know. Maybe, maybe pitiful in training. I don't know. Something. But his brothers sold him into slavery. They take him into Egypt. They sell him to Potiphar's house, an officer of Pharaoh. And he's a nice looking man. He gets the attention of Potiphar's wife. And she decides she wants this boy. And she starts playing for him. She starts flirting with him trying to get his attention. And Joseph is a good man. He's there to serve Potiphar. And she gets a hold of him one day and says, lie with me. And he loses his coat over it. He lost his coat, but he kept his integrity. 
And he runs out the house, and she then turns on him and tells Potiphar, he's been playing for me. He's been trying to get with me. He's been doing all this stuff. Look, he even came after me, and I just screamed, and I grabbed his coat, and I have his coat as proof. She turned the whole thing on him. And, of course, then he goes to prison for it. But he prospers not only in Potiphar's house before this happens, but even in the false accusation of raping Potiphar's wife, he gets put in prison, and he doesn't get bitter. He doesn't say, I can never get up. This whole world's against me. I'm cursed. I'm not blessed. I've been sold into slavery by my brothers. Now I've been betrayed. Now I've got felony written on my, tar- on, on my paper, and now they're saying that I'm going to be in this prison serving out my time. But Joseph gets up and stays, instead and begins to work and serve in the prison. And he becomes the servant of the prison guard, and he's able to do things and help with caring for the prison. He doesn't try to break out. And because he's put into Potiphar's, Potiphar's prison, or the place where Potiphar would put him in is Pharaoh's prison, he has access to Pharaoh's servants. And Pharaoh's cupbearer makes him mad one day and throws him in prison. And the baker gets thrown in prison as well. Well, Joseph just so happens to be in the same prison at the same time when they have dreams. And the cupbearer has a dream, and Joseph tells him his dream because he's been very familiar with dreams and the interpretations of them because he's already had his own. And he tells the cupbearer that you're not going to be released, that that you're going to be released and you're going to serve at the, at the cup of the king again and you're going to be his cupbearer and his, his butler and you're going to help him. But the baker, he says, you're not going to be released. Your head's going to be lifted off of your, of your shoulders and it's very graphic, but it says that you're going to lose your life. And we understand that Joseph is a picture of Jesus and that the cup is what Jesus lifted on the day when he had supper with his disciples. And he said, drink of this cup And then he said, this body, which is the bread, will be broken for you. And Joseph is a picture, and this this dream is a picture of what Jesus did at the table at the Last Supper. So you see Joseph being the Jesus of the Old Testament. So many parallels to his life. When you watch Joseph's life and you apply it to Jesus, you can see the same stuff happening. Joseph said, when you get out of here, to the cup bearer, when you take the cup, remember me. Jesus lifted the cup, says, when you take of this, do it in remembrance of me. It's the same story just told in a different era. And he was elevated to the position in Egypt. Pharaoh then had a dream, and the cup bearer, two years later, remembers, oh, there was this dude I promised I would tell him. I would tell the king if, if, if I was ever asked. And so he tells the king, there is a dream teller. In the, and his dreams are told from him from God. And they said, go clean him up and bring him to the king and let him tell the story. And the king tells him his dreams. And, of course, Joseph, leaning upon God, interprets the dreams of the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh says, okay, there's going to be years of famine and there's going to be years of plenty. He said, I want you to take charge, Joseph. I want you to set grain back in the years of plenty so that there's food to eat in the years of famine. So Joseph is back to bearing up sheaves. And so he rises to power, and the cupbearer told Joseph about the gift of dream-telling is there, and Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams and the prediction of the years of plenty and famine caused him to be elevated to the second most powerful person in the land of Egypt. Pharaohs were considered gods to those people. And he was under that because he always, always put God first. He didn't point at who forgot him. He didn't point at, look at all I've done. He didn't point at, you know how hard I work and nobody recognizes it. He could have pointed at anything and been justified. You would have patted him on the back and said, I get it. I know. It's like that. Life will kick you when you're down. But instead of pointing at all of those things, he pointed at God every time, and that put him at the highest position of the land. Your excellence is found in who you point at. 
Do you have the mental stability and the mental strength to lay down offenses? Woe unto you, the Bible says, who offense comes. Can you set the offense down and stop blaming others and start pointing to Jesus and say, God is my vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I release it to God so that he can be the God who does justice. He is a God who does justice better than we can. Amen? <laughs> Joseph recognized he's a God of justice, so he's tested because God doesn't trust anything that's not tested. So he's tested, and his character stands up to the pressure of being in charge. And from the re it reveals and reconciles his family to him because when they run out of food, they come to Egypt to get more sheaves. And when they go before him, his father and his mother bow down to his position. What Joseph saw in his dream happened, but it did not happen the way Joseph would have even imagined it. Dreams are often fulfilled, and you don't even know you're standing in the fulfillment. Because they'll look different than you thought they did. I know you always wanted to own a business. I know you always wanted to be ahead of things and get, and get enough money set aside where you could be comfortable and not live paycheck to paycheck. But you might get in a position of blessing and not even know that that's going to produce what you always wanted because it doesn't quite look like you thought it would. In fact, opportunity, you've heard it, shows up in overall sometimes. And sometimes you pray for a mountain to be moved and God will move it. And other times you pray for a mountain to move and you open up your eyes and a shovel has showed up. And God says, I want you to move it. Because by you working through it, you coax strength out of your life that you did not know was there. And you build strength in your character. If you take the elevator to the top, you will not have the strength of character to handle what's at the top. But if you take the steps and you go through the suffering and you walk through the, the betrayals and you walk through the trials and you don't point at people and you say, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness and hype. If you constantly say, he is my refuge and my strength. If you constantly point at him, your forgiveness will grow. You'll be able to forgive people for things you never thought you could forgive people for. And you'll have reunion in your family. And you'll have reunion in relationship because you know people just can get sideways sometimes, but God can turn anything around. He can turn anything around. My grandfather was like walking out to the mailbox and they had no money. He was pastoring. They were living in the back of the church. Like literally there was a door like right there and they lived in a small area and they needed to pay their furnace bill. It was Alaska. It's cold. And so he walked out. He said, God, you know we're desperate. We need, they're going to turn off the heat if we don't have something. And he walked to the mailbox with 100% faith believing that when you opened that mailbox, there was going to be something in there to take care of that bill. Because God had done it so many times for him. He just pointed his whole life toward God. And he opened the mailbox and it was empty. And he said, my heart sunk because I had so much faith to believe he goes, and so I turned around. I said, well, God, you know, I'm not going to blame anything. I'm not going to point fingers at anybody. I'm not going to say, if only it had been this way, I'd be better off. If only I'd had a better college degree or an opportunity, I would be better off. He said, I'm just going to keep pointing my life toward you. And he walked back across that road. And when he got on the other side of that road, a car pulled up. The window rolled down a little bit. I don't know what this is. Do you guys, do you guys remember that? <laughs> Anybody, if you buy a new car, ask them for one of those, and they'll just look at you funny. Are you okay? Do we need to get you some help? What's wrong with your arm? The window rolled down, and he said, are you the pastor of this church? And he said, yes, I am. And he shoved an envelope this fat out the window. He said, these are my ties for the last two years, my sheaves. These are my tithes for the last two years. I just wanted to give them to the preacher. Are you the preacher? He said, yes, I am. He said, this is for you. Please use it to help the church. He took it, and it was more than enough to cover their bills. The mailbox was empty, but his faith was still full. It didn't happen the way he thought it would happen, but God still fulfilled it.
Can I tell you some place, somebody in this place, there is something in your life that didn't happen the way you thought it should happen. But I minister to you today as someone that has dealt, dealt with it and gone through it. God will make a way anyways. God will provide anyways. Even if it didn't happen the way you thought it should happen, God will make a way. And it will come to pass just as you dreamed it. God will help you do it. Because my grandfather dreamed that church. He knew God had called him there. And though that may be a church, I'm trying to apply it to your life in every single way to your family, to your relationships, to your prosperity, whatever God's doing in your life. Joseph left a legacy. Here's what I want to close with. Joseph left a legacy of God rewards those who diligently seek him. That's Bible. That's not just us hoping for something from God. That's not us pie in the sky this thing and let's hope and forget about all we see, put blinders on and just have faith. Hey, when you believe in God, you're believing for things that you will not see until he does them. And it will look like it's not happening sometimes. It will look like it's going the other direction. He wasn't going towards success. Joseph was going further into prison. But God's directive and God's economy is sometimes opposite from what we think it should be. Sometimes God will flip the script on you, amen? And you feel like it's not working, and all of a sudden, the sky will clear, sun will come out, and a blessing will show up. And all of a sudden, someone's handing you an envelope full of money to pay the bill through a window. I'm just saying God rewards those who point their lives toward him. Everybody say, point your life toward God. Very good. So the reward sold into slavery had a situation come up where he was put in jail, got the ear of Potiphar, I mean, got the ear of Pharaoh, told the dream, got put in charge. That was approximately 22 years. I looked it up, okay? You just trust me. I dug through this, this Bible and found out it was 22 years from betrayal to reunion with his family. How hard is it for us to wait 20 minutes? Sometimes we pray and think God should just show up immediately. What if God's got you in a process right now? And the process is what's going to build you. 22 years from time of betrayal to renewal. And then the time, listen to this, the time from the renewal with his family to Joseph's death. You know how long that was? A hundred and 23 years. He spent more time in God's blessings than he did in God's preparation. It's powerful. God gave Joseph 101 years of blessing over the 22 years of going through it. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what life has thrown at you. And I don't know how many times you're going to have to point back to God because there's so many things you could point at. I have physical issues. I cannot be, I'm not able to do things. I have sickness that came on my body. I was not born with good genetics. I wasn't given the strength of mind to do some things. He had a blessed life for 123 years after he went through 22 years of trials. And I want to tell somebody here today, if you start pointing at God, he'll make sure the latter end is greater than the former. He'll make sure what you went through is not wasted. He'll make sure what you have when you come out is better than anything you had to go through. Would you stand with me today? So Joseph lived 101 years longer in the prosperity of God. You know what else happened? Joseph didn't just get blessed with the grace of God after his trials. His children got blessed. His two sons were blessed with a blessing that's different than any other blessing. Because in those days, the right hand meant power. And Jacob went to bless Manasseh and Ephraim. And instead of putting the right hand on the older child and the left hand on the younger child, he switched his hands, and he created a blessing that the last shall be the first, 
And those that are underdogs that point toward heaven will come out above. And those that have not will become the head. And those that do not know where they came from or what they're going, going to go through will become the ones that he's faithful to enough to give them great blessing. God reversed it in his children, and his children were named among the 12 disciples. I want you to know that whatever blessing you need, God will not be late with that if you trust him. Would you just maybe lift your hands toward heaven for a minute and just say, God, I don't know what anybody's going through here in this place, but God, I'm just asking you to help us to point everything towards you today. Lord, there may be some blessings in our life. We may be doing great. But even in the great moments, Joseph chose to bless you anyways because you may have everything going right and have people attacking you. You may have everything going right and have your past show up and say you should be bitter. You may have everything going okay right now, but you've been through the hardest six months of your life. You may have everything going right now for you, but you just went through a miscarriage. And you don't know why God needed to take that baby angel home. I don't know what you're going through, but what I want you to know is if you just point toward heaven today and say, Jesus, I'm going to give you my life. Everything in my life is going to keep pointing to you. Good, bad, blessings, not blessings, bank account full, not so full. I'm going to give you everything of me because the most important thing is my relationship with you, God, and, and the saving of a soul, my soul. So I'm asking you today to bless somebody in this room, somebody who needs to point their life towards you, Jesus. We know that if we repent and we're baptized in the name of Jesus, that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and that if we walk with God, that he'll fill us with his spirit. And in the filling of his spirit, he moves with us throughout our day. He goes with us. He said he'll never leave you or forsake you. So I pray that anyone here that's felt forsaken is reminded again that if I just lift my head toward heaven and I give my life pointed toward you, Jesus, I want to point my needs towards you. I want to point my, my everything. I want to point everything toward God. Today, if you want to do that, I'm opening this altar. We do an altar call. But if there's something in your life where you want to give it to Jesus, I'm praying you'll come down here and surrender it and say, Lord, I'm not going to point fingers anymore. You're welcome to come. If you step out of your pew and you come down here, nobody's going to make fun of you. This is not us putting anybody on display, but this is us gathering in together to pray and ask the Lord, Lord, would you please help me to remember, though the struggle may seem long, you're going to give greater days. Though it may seem like I've been in this for 22 years, you're going to give me another 101 of blessing. And those may not be actual years, and, and I know that the story is, but I'm just saying in the, in, the, in the long term, at the end of the day, you will look back over your life and see more blessings than cursing. See more benefit with walking with God than, than not. And you'll see more, more help and more health and more touch from heaven in your life if you just keep pointing everything toward Jesus. Would you come right now and just lift your hands? In this altar, we're just making a moment of surrender. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I want more of you in my life. Would you pray this with me? Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I want more of you in my life. Jesus, would you come near my heart today? Jesus, would you change anything in me? Say that, Jesus, would you change anything in me that needs to be changed? Say, would you help my life point towards you in every way? I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you just need to lay anything down, if you've carried any bitterness, if you carried any sorrows, if you carried any heaviness, would you just lay that down right now at, at this altar call? Would you just say, God, I'm going to let go. I know it's not easy to let go, but if you let go, your hands open to receive something new from God. So I'm asking you to let it go. I don't know what's been done to you. I don't know who did it. It does not matter. We're not pointing a finger today. 
we're going to lift our hands in just a minute, and we're going to point toward heaven. And when we do that, I want everything that you've been carrying. I have my eyes closed because I don't want to see anybody. I just know somebody in here has been carrying a heavy burden, and I want us to leave it today at the foot of the cross, imagery, the imagery of the cross. Put that in your mind. And would you just stand there and see that Jesus died for all this? And would you just let it go today? You say, Lord, I give it to you. Would you make justice out of this injustice? What they said, what they did, what they forced upon me, would you let it go right now? There's a healing in this room. There's a spirit of healing. There's a release of angels that wants to minister. Whatever you've been through and whatever you've come out of, God wants to heal it, but you have to let it go. You have to let go of the grudges. You have to let go of the stories that you've told over and over again of how they betrayed you. You have to let it all go today. And you'll start walking in the blessing of God brand new. You'll start walking in a way that's totally different than where you've been. The weight of that thing can come off of you right now in Jesus' name. By the authority of the Word of God and by the power of the Holy Ghost, I release somebody in this room from a generational scar or for a wound that they've been carrying for too long that has hollowed out their heart and they feel like they are not where they need to be with God. I pray you help them to not run to things that they're using to cope with the pain, but they release it today. They let go in their hands. Somebody pray this. I lay it down. In Jesus' name. And now would you lift your hands and just point toward heaven. We just lift your hands and worship him right now. And just point toward heaven. God, I give you my all. I give you my days. No matter how long or how short, I point my life towards you. And I know it's not rude to point, God, because you're going to show yourself strong in my life. I prayed in Jesus' name. Would you give the Lord a hand of praise as we thank him, as we thank him right now. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Come on, clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God with the Lord. Thank you, God. We were able to lay some things down here today. Thank you, God, for new life, new hope. Thank you, God, that we can point everything to you. Would you hug somebody near you? Would you just give them a blessing? And would you just say thank you for praying near me? If you came to this altar, God bless you. You can keep praying, but thank you for being here. Visitors, we love you. Wednesday night revival. Just come and enjoy the, the music. Come and enjoy. We're going to have a great time. How many feel like your life can be given to God and he can do the best with it? He can do the best with it. God bless you as you point toward Jesus.